Well, welcome back to Redeemed by Grace Fellowship as we continue our study, our Christmas series, a, a Christmas of old, seeing Jesus through the eyes of the Old Testament. I hope you've enjoyed it so far, and we're going to continue today looking at Ezekiel uh, chapter 34, and we're going to talk about the shepherd, the shepherd. Uh, before we do that, though, I do want to remind you to make sure that you go down below and to click on that uh, that subscribe button. Make sure you hit that notification bell uh, so that you never miss out on anything we uh, do download. And make sure that you do share this out to your friends, to all of them, in fact, uh, so that they will have an opportunity to take a look at that. And if we go back, let me reset this. I don't know why I had it at the end instead of the beginning for you. There we go. There. Now you can actually see all that stuff. So go ahead and, like I said, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Right down below, hit that subscribe button so you never miss out on anything that we do post. And also go out to our other platforms and make sure you do uh, uh, subscribe to those as well. We have different content that appears on each of those. You will find us not only here on YouTube, all our video stuff will be either here on YouTube or it will be on Rumble. We put it on Rumble as well because uh, sometimes uh, we've seen some censorship going on with YouTube. Not necessarily us, but it's happening. So we want to make sure that you always have that content no matter what happens. So if anything does get censored, boom, just pop over to Rumble. You'll find that week's lesson without any hitch. But make sure that you also go out to Facebook, to Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and True Social. You'll also find us out there on LinkedIn. And uh, some of you uh, got us started messing around with Pinterest a little bit. So you'll see some of our stuff there as well, um, but uh, uh, not as much as you will on the others. But make sure that right now that you do go and you just hit all those platforms. You never miss out on anything and uh, that as well. Also, at any time that you need to reach us, whether you have a prayer request, whether you have a, a praise that you'd like us to celebrate, whether you have a need that's going on in, in your life um, and you need to talk about it, uh, or whether you have questions about material, whether you have suggestions for new material, whether you feel that, hey, I want to be part of that ministry, I think I can help. I can either help with designing the uh, graphics and things on the background and the videos and working with that kind of stuff in the background, or I can uh, work with music uh, type of thing, or maybe I'm a lady who would like to uh, work with ladies and have a women's ministry or children's ministry or whatever it might be that you think God's leading you to. Hit us up on that email, rbgf22 at yahoo.com. And let's have a conversation about it. Again, we do try to stay uh, with our communications via email to protect your privacy and to prevent those trolls from attacking when you have some serious questions. And it also gives you a little more privacy. Uh, and I know that some of your prayer requests are probably very private. And so let's keep it that way um, and do that as well. So. Uh, that is where you will find us. Again, today we're going to be looking at the shepherd from Ezekiel 34. Uh, this is our sixth lesson uh, as we've gone through this. Again, looking at Jesus through the Old Testament. And it's been a wonderful study so, so far. and We're close to being done. Uh, but I uh, 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 hope you've enjoyed it. If you've missed any of them, you can go back. Uh, and watch the others as well, because they've been kind of progressive a little bit as we've kind of worked our way through it. But, um, and we do, we'll probably hit on them a little bit as far as uh, this new material, uh, because it kind of builds on it, it's like I said. Uh, 
But as promised, uh, when we started this series, I wanted to start off in our prayer time with something special for you, and that is to pray uh, specifically through one of the Psalms that has uh, the same type of theme of what we're going to be looking for today. So uh, let's take some t uh, time right now and let's pray together before we get started. So let's pray. Lord God, you are indeed our shepherd. You lead us out of the wilderness of darkness and into your holy land of light. And thus we sing with the psalmist. But he led forth his own people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And he led them safely so that they, so that they did not fear. But the sea engulfed their enemies and so they brought them into this holy land to this hill country, which is right, uh, uh, which his right hand has gained. And so, Lord, we're great. We gratefully pray to save your people and bless your inheritance. Be our shepherd also and carry us forever. And Lord Jesus, uh, bless us with your mercy, peace, and love that we might live in your grace and with each other and standing firm on your truth and boldly and obediently preaching your gospel to each other and to all the peoples of the earth. And by your grace, draw all near to you and into your kingdom. Lord Jesus, bless, uh, redeemed by grace, fellowship with new followers to fellowship with in Christ and to further the work that you give us to do. Heavenly Father, this is your word, and we thank you for it. And we ask that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful things in it. And Father, this is an unfamiliar word. It's not a passage that we dwell on often. But you have so much to teach us in it. And so we pray by, by your Holy Spirit, you would, we would be able to understand it. We would believe it. And you would so press its truth home to our hearts that our hearts would respond in faith to you. And we lift this prayer in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, the name that we love. And all God sure to say, Amen, and Amen, and Amen. Well, as we get started on this, uh, uh, as usual, I will kind of uh, get off the screen and go with a larger screen so that you can read the text as we begin to it. Again, we will be using, when we uh, look at uh, Ezekiel 34, we'll be using that one of those Bible apps. And if you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. You can always download uh, several different apps out there that are fantastic and I recommend. But several of them, are, they're all free, by the way. But Gateway is one that is uh, that I'm use, using today, and I will play the audio as it's being read. And I'm playing it for one uh, reason. I, I like you to see that that can be utilized to spend time with God in the Scripture, especially amongst our busy lives where we're having to, to do things. So if you have to commute to work, if, whatever it might be, you have an opportunity to spend some time in the car, or uh, if you go out jogging, uh, put on a headset, yeah, all these things you can be in the Word of God uh, while you're doing things. I mean, reading it and spending time in solitude is very important, but hearing it is just as important because sometimes we hear better than we think when our mind's wandering. And so uh, 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 we're going to use the Bible Gateway when we get to the point where we're ready to, uh, to start that. But first, I want to kind of give you set that scene, you know, the background, the historical, where we're at, and those types of things, so that you kind of recall. I mean, it's been building over our last few lessons. Well, if you have your Bibles, again, turn with me to chapter 34, as we continue to work our way through it. And, uh, and the series, again, is a Christmas of old, seeing Jesus through the Old Testament. So here's the scene. In the year... Uh, Forgot to go full screen for you. There you go. Promised and didn't do it. So in the year uh, uh, 597 BC, Ezekiel was called into the ministry by 
a river in Babylon. That's in uh, modern day Iraq. And with a vision of the glory of God. Well, Ezekiel, as a teenager, would perhaps have heard Jeremiah preach. We've heard from him a little bit through this study. And many of the passages in this book are reflections on those passages from Jeremiah's preaching. And so you hear some of that same tone and things that come along that. In fact, we studied, uh, we studied the branch passage together as part of this series, uh, and that was from Jeremiah chapter 23. Excuse me. But Ezekiel 34 looks like a reflection on that text. Ezekiel was a, a, a contemporary of Daniel. If you remember Daniel uh, there in Babylon, he was a contemporary of him. He was uh, the great, uh, you know, Daniel was the great leader and prophet of God's people there. And you remember Daniel also quotes and reads from Jeremiah as well why he's in exile in Babylon. And, and so that's kind of setting who's who's what and, and what's going on with all these different prophets, where they're at, and what's happening. Well, in uh, 597 B.C., Ezekiel was part of the exiles that were taken to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar who had just conquered Israel. And that same year, Nebuchadnezzar uh, set up Je Je uh, Zedekiah as a puppet king, as a uh, king who was kind of uh, had a lot of tributary to him. And he was of the line of David, but was subservient to Nebuchadnezzar. And Zedekiah, uh, uh, again, was nothing more than a puppet king, and he would become the last king of Israel. Zedekiah would reign about 10 years, and then about uh, 587 B.C., Zedekiah rebelled against Zebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar. Boy, I can't talk today. And the rebellion failed, and Nebuchadnezzar's fury was hot as you can imagine. And when Zedekiah attempted to escape, he was captured and he was brought before Nebuchadnezzar and his sons were brought for him and they were slaughtered right before his eyes. And then his eyes were put out and he was put in chains and taken to Babylon where he lingered long and he died so that the, the last thing the last thing that he would ever saw with his eyes was the end of the line of David, oh, or so he thought, right? Or so he thought, because if we've been paying attention to these promises that are coming up, we know there's something coming. There's someone coming. And we know, and of course, we know who that's going to be. Uh, and these were basically serious, serious times. The great challenges uh, to Israel's faith. Um, and you could imagine how the Israelites would have wondered, you know, where is God in all of this? I mean, they're seeing the mess of the world. They're seeing all the troubles. They're seeing everything going on. And that's a question. And that's a question that you and I seem to ask even in our day is, we see all the chaos going on, even in our own country, and we begin to say, where is God in all this? And, well, God, the God who promised David here that, uh, that there would never be a lack of a man on his throne forever, that he would always have an heir off his throne to be in power. And God, who promised that uh, his people would be planted in the land, and now the people are in exile. So they, they went into the promised land, and they, they were given their territories, as the, each of the tribes did that. Many years go by, many conflicts, uh, many things and lessons learned, and yet uh, here we are, uh, They because they Ahaz, uh, if you remember Ahaz, Ahaz uh, decided to make a treaty. 
and as he made a treaty uh, to protect himself from the two of the northern tribes of Israel, kind of a somewhat civil war, if you will. And uh, uh, so he, he is aligns with the Assyrians. Well, that didn't go very well. And uh, so and so forth. So, and again, uh, God told, told him, hey, if you do this, it ain't going to be pretty because judgment's coming. But uh, he has thought he knew better than God, and he was going to do his own thing, and did. And, well, fast forward a few hundred years, and here we are. We're in exile. Uh, Babylon's come in. You see the Syrians move. You better get over there now. Uh, so the Babylonians, they come in. They take back the, the land. They take everybody, uh, all the uh, basically as slaves. You pick, pick all the people and all the spoils, and you take them back to your country, and they become subservient to you. And that's exactly what's happening. And But all during all this time, uh, God rose up uh, great prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel to speak to these people in these very dark, dark times that they were in. And when, uh, and even though that they, they themselves were in exile with them in the Babylon, and it's it's a it's a prophecy about a shepherd king who is to come. And so let's hear it read. Let's just go right to it, hear the scripture read. And so I'm going to play it. I hope that it records okay for you and not too loud. Uh, but here we go. We're again going to be hearing Ezekiel 34. Chapter 34. Though the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who were sickly you have not strengthened. The diseased you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up. The scattered you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd, and they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. My flock wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. My flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth, and there was no one to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my flock has become a prey, my flock has even become food for all the beasts of the field for lack of a shepherd. And my shepherds did not search for my flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep. So the shepherds will not feed themselves any more. but I will deliver my flock from their mouth so that they will not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the streams and in all the inhabited places of the land. I will feed them in a good pasture, and their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. There they will lie down on good grazing ground and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with judgment. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will judge between one sheep and another, between the rams and the male goats. Is it too slight a thing for you that you should feed in the good pasture, that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pastures, or that you should drink of the clear waters, that you must foul the rest with your feet? 
As for my flock, they must eat what you tread down with your feet and drink what you follow with your feet. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you push with side and with shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns until you have scattered them abroad. Therefore, I will deliver my flock, and they will no longer be a prey, and I will judge between one sheep and another. Then I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will make a covenant of peace with them and eliminate harmful beasts from the land so that they may live securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I will make them in the places around my hill a blessing, and I will cause showers to come down in their season. They will be showers of blessing. Also the tree of the field will yield its fruit, and the earth will yield its increase, and they will be secure on their land. Then they will know that I am the Lord, when I have broken the bars of their yoke and have delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them. They will no longer be a prey to the nations, and the beasts of the earth will not devour them, but they will live securely and no one will make them afraid. I will establish for them a renowned planting place, and they will not again be victims of famine in the land, and they will not endure the insults of the nations any more. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. As for you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, you are men, and I am your God, declares the Lord God. All righty. Well, we're going to take a look here at about six things as we get, break down this and kind of walk through it a little bit. We're first of all going to uh, see these uh, from what you see on the screen right there. And, and so this will help us understand where Ezekiel is coming from and, and where he is going in this particular message. And the first part we see is in verses 1 through 6, where the Lord will indict the kings and priests of Israel for their failure in leading Israel. And then in verses 7 through 10, he'll bring a judgment against the leaders of Israel, both kings and priests, for failing in their responsibility to God and to his people. And third, in verses 11 through 17, God will announce, since these leaders have been unfaithful, and since these kings have failed their purposes with my people, I am going to be the king of my people. That's what he always wanted anyway, right? And I'm going to be the leader of my people. I myself am going to intervene on their behalf. I'm going to bring them out of their captivity. I'm going to place them back in their land, and I'm going to fill their lives with blessings and plenty, and I'm going to delegate this. I'm not going to delegate this to anybody. I am going to do it myself. But then when we get to verses 17 through 19, uh, the Lord turns from his salvation uh, uh, or situation with the leaders of Israel, and he turns to the people themselves, and he pronounces judgment on the selfish people in Israel who have oppressed their fellow citizens. And he says, I'm going to separate sheep from sheep. I'm going to separate the righteous from the unrighteous. I'm going to separate the oppressors from the weak. I'm going to judge the oppressors, and I'm going to save and rescue the weak. Then in verses 20 through 24, he announces that he is going to set up a successor to David to lead his people. Now, feel the tension there for a minute. In verses uh, 11 through 16, he says, no more. I'm not delegating this. I'm going to lead my people. God himself is going to lead his people. But in verse 
verses uh, 20 through 24, he says, I'm going to set up a successor to David to lead my people. And, of course, the question is, huh, which is it? Which is it? And Ezekiel, so empathetic that God himself is, will be kings when uh, this is uh, that he's speaking about in, in 2024. And how can it be that if the, uh, he will lead his people? Uh, he himself and he appoint someone to lead the people? Uh, which is it, right? As kind of the thought process that uh, is being handled here. And then finally, in verses 25 through 31, the Lord says that he will establish a covenant of peace with his people. And again, uh, this is Ezekiel reflecting on what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 31, where he announces a, a new covenant that God's going to make with his people. That God promises uh, to shepherd his people himself. That God promises to appoint a shepherd for his people. How does uh, how did he do those things at the same time? Well, I myself, he says, will be your shepherd. I will appoint a shepherd for you. Ezekiel and Jesus explain the meaning of this passage when we look at the great point of this passage that God has promised and provided the shepherds that his people will have their needs met and the shepherd uh, that is his people needs or needs to be himself but on the other way we'll see s several things that uh, to that number one point and those are the six parts of Ezekiel 34. So let's start to dig into all this and try to figure out what are we talking about in each of these six things that we see. So the first thing has to do with the shepherd. In the word of God, uh, shepherd, by the way, is a metaphor for both spiritual and religious leaders. And the scriptures are the uh, and the shepherd as a metaphor is also used for kings it is well known on both inside and outside of the scriptures that that is the case on that metaphor and if we go back almost uh four and a half thousand years to uh 2450 bc uh, we could find the story of an ancient Sumerian king who said that his God uh, owned the land and appointed him to be shepherd over it. And that image of kings as uh, being shepherds was a common thing in the ancient Near East. In fact, in and around Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel's time, let me try and pronounce this one. This is a, a mouthful here, but it's Ashab uh, He was the king of Assyria, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, uh, both called themselves shepherds. It, it was a classic image, friends, of, of kings. In fact, if you remember that Isaiah will call the pagan uh, Persian king uh, Cyrus, a, a shepherd, because the Lord was going to use Cyrus to bring them back uh, into the promised land. And so shepherds, a metaphor for uh, spiritual and governmental or political leaders. And in this passage, when Ezekiel uh, speaks out uh, about the shepherds of Israel and and notice he takes that, that phrase uh, uh, multiple times in verse 2. Let me change the page so you can see that. He says, uh, we see him using that several times, the shepherds of Israel, the shepherds of Israel. He's speaking to the kings of Israel and the ruling that he's speaking to the priest as well. And so it's important to, for us to understand that when the Old Testament uses the image of a, of a shepherd, that's often a shepherd, or an image uh, for the king and for spiritual leaders of the land. Why? Because shepherds are supposed to look out for the well-being of the flock. 
and, the, and specifically the flock that has been entrusted to them. And just as religious and governmental leaders are supposed to be serving the interests of the people in their care. And so we need to understand that first, shepherds is a metaphor for spiritual and governmental leaders. I wish our leaders today are watching this, right? <laughs> well, there's a second thing we see. And here we see the Lord's prophetic indictment against Israel's shepherds because of their failures. We see an indictment against the kings, the ruling class, and even the priests because of the way they have failed Israel. They have failed to shepherd. They have failed to lead well. And notice especially, let me change a page here, in verses 3 and 4, how this is described. Verse 2, should not shepherds feed the sheep? Yet what, is, what have the Israel's uh, leaders done? What have they done? <laughs> well, you eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. So these people that are entrusted to you, you're taking care of yourself, but you're not taking care of them in any way. Not in a physical form or a spiritual form. Instead of uh, feeding the sheep, they feed on the sheep. You, you, so you're supposed to be sheeting the feet. And, and that metaphor there that, that I just used, it, you're supposed to be feeding the sheep, but yet you're feeding on the sheep. You're, you're feeding on the people uh, and, and taking away from them as opposed to taking care of them, both spiritually and physically. Now, remember that Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel all confronted kings, the kings of Israel, for not trusting in God. And we saw that with, with several of the lessons that we've come back to. And we do that from making these entangling alliances with these pagan nations and with committing idolatry themselves so that Instead of looking after the spiritual well-being of Israel, they had done what they wanted to do. And they, instead of feeding the sheep, they fed on the sheep and they led them astray. They didn't serve them well. And God's indicting them of that. Look again at uh, verses three and four here. And those who are strictly... Uh, excuse me, those who are sickly, you have not strengthened. The diseased, you have not healed. The broken, you have not bound up. The scattered, you have not brought back, nor looked after them. As a shepherd cares for his flock on the day when he is uh, among his scattered sheep. So I will care for my sheep, and I will rescue them out of the places where they are scattered on a cloudy a gloomy day. Oh, I messed up getting your page here. Let me go back to where we're at. Do, 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 do. There we go. Here's where it's supposed to be. Sorry about that. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the streams and all the inhabited places uh, of the land. And I will feed them in, in a good pasture and their grazing place will be on the mount, uh, on the uh, mountain heights of Israel. There they will uh, lie down in a good grazing place and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. And I myself will feed my flock and I myself will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. Friends, this whole passage, in this whole passage, God repeatedly says, no more appointees, no more kings to do this in my place. 
I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to be your king. I'm going to be your shepherd. I'm going to provide for your security. I'm going to seek you out and bring you back from the land. I'm going to plant you in firm pasture. I'm going to bring blessing upon you. I'm going to do all this myself. And so the Lord's announcing that he himself will be the shepherd of his people. And so this is so important because uh, the kings of Israel have been looking to alliances and to uh, uh, with other nations as a source of the security of God's people. And God's saying, no, your security won't come from them. It won't come from any earthly source. In fact, your alliance with other nations is going to take you into exile and you're going to be scattered all over the earth. But I myself, I'm going to be your shepherd. I'm going to bring you, I'm going to be your king. I'm going to bring you back. My friends, the Lord acts for our benefit and his glory. He feeds us uh, what he knows will give us health. And he makes us lie down when we need rest. He, friends, is the great shepherd. Now, fifth, the Lord's judgment turns to his own people. So he's moving away from all this uh, judgment against the religious leaders, against the kings, and all those that uh, uh, have brought affliction. And now he looks directly at the people and say, hey, it's not just them. You yourselves aren't taking care of each other either. There's a big problem here. And so let's take a look what he says here. Uh, he, again, he turns towards his own people. And here in verses uh, 17 through 19, and we find him, he judges the selfish sheep. You see, the problem just wasn't among the uh, court, the king, the priest, as we talked about. Yes, the ruling class was very oppressive. But there was injustice going on, injustice at, at a high stake. Here's the rest of that verse, if you need to continue reading through that. Uh, at a very high stake. So, but there, so this was going on, and it was going on amongst the sheep. And, and so the Lord says, again, I am going to judge between the sheep and the sheep, between the rams and the goats. Uh, God's talking about establishing justice, punishing the wicked, and blessing those who have been unjustly oppressed. And so uh, then he's, in verses 20 to 24, he says, I'm going to appoint a successor to David. Well, look at verse 23. Then I will appoint over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them, and he will feed them himself and be their shepherd. So God's saying that he's going to give his people a shepherd, a servant, a prince like David, but better. But hold on. You know, back in 1116, he says, I'm going to be your king. I'm going to be your shepherd. No more appointees. And in 2024, he says, I'm going to appoint a shepherd, a servant, a prince like David, only better. And so you've got to ask, which one is it? Hey, God, are you going to, to be the shepherd of your people? Or are you going to appoint a shepherd of your people? Which is it? And the answer uh, to that question is, yes, <laughs> I'm going to be your king. I am your shepherd. I'm going to appoint a shepherd, a shepherd, a prince who is better than David. And only Jesus Christ, friends, can help you understand how those things come together. It's only Christ that can do that uh, in that because any other you have a conflict, don't you? You have a contradiction. And here it is. They're one and the same. They're one and the same. And so uh, that is exactly what we're looking at. So if we continue to look right down uh, 
if we continue to look at verses uh, 25 to 31, um, which will break that apart uh, so you don't have to look at the whole section of it. Uh, here's one final thing, that the Lord will establish his covenant of peace. Now, peace here doesn't just mean the stoppage of hostility. It means total well-being. Big difference in there. And the optimal condition for human flourishing is well-being. And God's saying, I'm going to establish. I'm going to bring about a covenant that will mean well-being for all my people. I'm going to do this through this shepherd, this servant, this prince, who is a successor to David, who is to come. And the results, he explains uh, here in verses 25 through 31, are going to be twofold. Look what he says, verse 27, right there on your screen. They will know that I am the Lord. If I read that whole verse, uh, also the tree of the field will yield its fruit and, and the earth. And it will yield its produce, and they will secure it on their land. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bars of their yoke, and I have saved them from uh, himself, all who have enslaved them. And so uh, there it is. It's hard to read that one word with the glow. Font's not real good on that screen. But. That is the key. I want you to see that they will know that I am the Lord. And again, in, in uh, let me flip the page here. And again, here in verse 30, they will know that I am the Lord, their God. Again, there's that same phrase that he is he's trying to get across. Uh, they don't know exactly how many times Ezekiel says this, uh, but it's at least 50 times in this particular book. And there's a, it's one of the great themes of this book that you will know that I am the Lord. And so one of the results of God being the shepherd and God providing uh, this servant is that we're really going to have an expirational knowledge of God as God we're going to understand, God, I belong to you, I'm your people, and you're my God. No more going after false gods, no more looking at God in all the wrong places, no more seeking treasure in anything and everything but God himself and finding, but finally finding in God the Lord that we have been looking for. Stop looking at the world and anything the world has to offer and looking directly at God. If you will know that I am the Lord, you will know that I am the Lord when I have done this. It's basically what he's saying here. But the second effect is this. Uh, it's total well-being. They will experience total well-being. And again, that's repetitive, yes, for a particular reason. He calls it a covenant of peace. And did you catch the words of verse 26 there? I will cause showers to come down in their season, and they will be showers of blessing. You, wonder, you, you wondered where the old gospel song was from? There will be showers of blessing. Well, there it is. It's a sequel 34. And God's saying, I will shower you, uh, shower you with total well-being. And that's what the biblical word shalom means or, or peace means. I'm going to shower you with peace and total well-being. But how does that all go together? Uh, God's going to be the shepherd. He's going to appoint a shepherd. And listen to the Gospel of Luke. You don't have to look this one up. I don't have it on the screen. So you could just listen as I read this here. But listen to the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to be looking at chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. 
And you know what this is. It, it's the story of the birth of Jesus. It, it who's the first group of people to ever hear someone say Merry Christmas. Well, it was shepherds. And, and that's very interesting. Shepherds. <laughs> and here it is. There were shepherds abiding in the fields and watching their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto them and said, Fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For today unto you in the city of David is born a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And then with the angel uh, appears a multitude of heavenly hosts. And listen, my friends, what do they sing? They sing, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. Now, that's very interesting. Shepherds are greeted with a message of peace from the angels about a Davidic king who's going to be born in a manger. And, and that's mind-blowing. I, I don't know uh, what, if that's not mind-blowing, I don't know what mind-blowing is. I don't know how to talk either, but that's okay. It, it, John, uh, let's flip the page for you. John 10, verse 27, uh, because if you're still saying, I, I don't understand how God's the king and how God appoints a king, if God's going to be king, if God's going to, to be a shepherd himself and he's going to appoint someone to be he's a shepherd, how does that all work? Well, again, look at this verse. My sheep will hear my voice and I will know them and they will follow me. Uh, and basically he's saying, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will, will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, uh, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now, Jesus uses the shepherd imagery constantly in his teaching. In both te testaments, God calls his people his flock. Why? For one thing, it's a term of an endearment and a picture of a close personal connection. For another, it, it reveals our total dependence upon him. And third, it honors him uh, as our shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's He tells us in this passage right here, uh, who cares for the sheep? He's the one who goes out after the one out of a hundred who wanders away and brings them back to the other 99. And in this passage, he says, I am the good shepherd and I won't lose any of my sheep. I won't lose the sheep. The, the father can't lose the sheep because I and the father are one. Now, how is it that God himself can be our king and shepherd, and, how, and he can appoint one to be our shepherd? Because the one that he appointed is God, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, and I and the Father are one. So God, uh, God appointed God to be our shepherd in Jesus Christ. And, and friends, uh, that's what the whole Christmas story is all about. That's what the whole Christmas story is all about. The shepherd we need is God. And God has appointed the shepherd that we need. And he is God. He is Jesus. My friends, what we need is more than anything this Christmas season is to believe God, to have faith in God, to put our trust in the shepherd that God has appointed, who is God. We live in a day and a time where the, the acid of unbelief is in the air, and it eats at our souls all the time. And that acid of unbelief uh, tempts us to do exactly what the kings of Israel did. What did they do? They didn't believe God, and they sought their own devices in order to find satisfaction, 
success and fulfillment, and they utterly failed. And here today, as we prepare for Christmas, more than anything else in the world, we need to believe God. What's the great message of Ezekiel 34? <laughs> I am the Lord your God, and you are my people, and I am the only one who can give you satisfaction. I'm the only one who can bless you. And if you look for satisfaction in, in that blessing, anywhere else, it will evade you. Friends, we need that message today in this modern world. As much or more than the kings of Israel of old did. Or more than even the people in exile needed that message. We need to believe and we need to do it now. And may God grant us belief in the shepherd that he has appointed who is himself the almighty God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. For this word to us and we pray that you would bless it to our hearts and that we would believe by the work of your holy spirit now grant that the uh, phrases that uh, we've read would come to the depths of our soul and that we would be changed forever because because of it and father if there's one here who has yet to accept you as Lord and Savior, to put that full faith and trust in you and you alone for salvation. I pray right now, Lord God, that you would bring a conviction about who they are without you. That you would show them the state of their sinfulness. And that there's nothing they can do about it. They can't try harder. They can't try to do better that they'll ultimately fail in anything but putting their trust in you, in you alone. And so we pray, Lord, uh, that you would make that known in our hearts and that you would move us to respond to that with belief and faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the shepherd that you have provided, the shepherd who is you. And we thank you for that. Thank you for the special Christmas gift you have given us in Christ, in Christ alone. We thank you. We praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Well, friends, if you have listened to this message today and you are a believer in Christ Jesus, he's commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations. We're not now just simply to sit on our hands, you know, we're to be active. At the moment of salvation, if we were of no value, he would have taken us strictly to heaven. But he left us here for a reason. And it's right there on your screen. There's many ways that you could do that. First of all, as we've I've said so many times, I'll try to say it on every video, Redeemed by Grace Fellowship is not meant to be a replacement or a substitute for the local church. We have a study out there on the book of Acts. If you haven't gone to that, go, go back and watch that. Go through that study. Because what you'll discover in that, that God designed the local church he put it together, he designed it, he blessed it, he moves it forward still today. And it's there for a specific reason. It's not there as a place that we go and, and, and necessarily do worship, although we do that. It's not necessarily a place that we go there and hear stories about the Bible, although we do that. That's called discipleship. It's not necessarily a place where we go to find a good youth group or a children's ministry for our kids, although we do that. It's not necessarily uh, anything about me. 
But God has gifted each one of us at the moment of salvation with specific gifts. And we don't even know what they are until we engage. But he tells us, I've done it. You go and do something. And that's why every single person, every believer is called to go and make disciples. It's not for the pastors or the deacons or the elders or uh, the priests or any of that. It is for each believer. And that's kind of why we came together as Redeemed by Grace Fellowship. Not to replace the local church, but to, to also provide a means where you can gather together in a large group and begin to take a look at the scriptures together and then utilize that to go back to your local church and to build upon it. And or taking these messages and sending them electronically. You know, one uh, once upon a time there used to be the church over here, and it was located in a building, and you needed to come to church. Well, today you have a, a generation that would never step foot in a church. Their whole purpose in life is to remain away, and yet God is moving in some of their hearts, and they're asking questions and trying to figure out stuff. And where do they go? They go online. And we know that a lot of that stuff is bogus and unfilling and worldly. And so we're trying to provide the truth, the truth that God has given us in his word. And so one of the ways, again, that you could help do that, go and make disciples, is by sharing this video. Yes, I want you to subscribe. I want you to subscribe so that you always get it. I want you to hit that notification bell so you know when it's dropped. The sharing, you know, that a lot of people uh, on YouTube will say sharing is caring. And if I want to take that to an utmost different, if you really care about going and making disciples, Sharing is caring in a whole different perspective. It's not caring making this channel grow. It's caring making people grow in Christ. That is what we're after. And I hope you'll join us in that by doing exactly that. Yes, subscribe on all our platforms, but share it out on all our platforms that th your friends, neighbors, and even strangers might see this message and come to know the truth of Jesus Christ. Well, friends, uh, our next lesson uh, will be uh, the ruler. We'll be looking at Micah, the first five verses of Micah. If you want to take a look at those, you'll find out. Uh, in fact, you ought to see some things flying around uh, online uh, introducing that that's coming up soon so uh, when you get that uh, you can you'll just take a look at those verses and you'll kind of be ready for us uh, on that but we'll look at that when we get together next time uh, Christmas is approaching fast so uh, we've got a few to get through and then uh, we'll have a message special message for Christmas as well so let's uh, do that and and uh, go on and so forth. Use that email address. Again, it's rbgf22 at yahoo.com. There it goes on the screen right now on the scroll bar. But uh, you can uh, utilize that to either A, send us prayer requests, send us uh, uh, praises that you want us to celebrate with you, bring up any concerns you might be having in life, whether it's concerns about, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, substance abuse, whatever it might be. There's a video with our co-founder out there that uh, you can find uh, on this channel as well that uh, is all about his story who come out of that and is able to help provide some counseling for that. So we'd love you to do that. If you have that, shoot us an email. Again, rbgf22 at yahoo.com. We'll be glad to have confidential 
uh, conversations with you about that. But also, it, it gets you help, too. And that's the most important thing. Uh, so uh, make sure that you do that. If you want to be part of this ministry, shoot us an email. Let us know uh, what it indeed you would like to do and what you, some of your talents are. And we'll kind of have those conversations. So, friends, uh, we're going to get out of here. Uh, we love you. And we will see you next week as we get into The Ruler with from Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Have a blessed day. Amen.